Thank you very much. Bom dia. Good afternoon. I'm sorry I do not yet speak Portuguese, although I've been here nearly three years, soon three years. But it's just too much to do, right? So bear with me, I have to do this in English. So I think uh, nanotechnology has a lot to do with sustainability. I will try to guide you through some of my perceptions about that. You see this picture? I think it's a beautiful picture. It's taken at the Atlantic Ocean, not far from here. Um, I think it symbolizes a lot of things. You see the, the sun, that's the energy. You see the uh, ocean, also the, the waves of uh, water, the power in that, and also the kind of feeling, the kind of emotional feeling. They have this kind of uh, goldish light that we appreciate a lot. And um, I think the most important is that these kind of views or these kind of sensations, we would like to keep them for the future. So we would like our grandchildren and grand, 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 grandchildren also to enjoy it. And we need to do some things in order to sustain it. And it's principally so that we are the, I would say, we are the first generation that actually have the tools to actively do something real radical about it. That we can preserve nature the way we can enjoy it now. We are also the, I would say, the, the last generation that have to do it. Because if we don't do it now, we are above a tipping point. Right? So we have the means, but we also have the challenge to actually engage. And it means we need to do things in a much more sustainable way. We need to change a lot of things that we nowadays are taking for granted. So we need to do a lot of things. And doing a lot of things has a lot to do with politics. Right? So politics is about uh, vision. It's about uh, vision to change, go from something to something else. And the politics needs to do this together with technology. So technology has to live in harmony with the kind of politics and in harmony with the society and the societal development. No one can do it alone. Everything is combined together. So we are living in a real, uh, I would say, in a real technology world today. Right? We are having uh, internet. We can um, make a Skype call with someone going to Asia. Um, we can consume music on the spot using Spotify, for instance. So we are living in a real technology world. And the technology is really immersing onto us or into us. And we heard this morning about the digitalization and the data. And so I would touch upon that. So when you look in this picture, you can say, well, maybe you see some technology. Maybe the most thing that you can see, this is, a, by the way, this is from uh, Saigon. It's a street view from uh, the backpacker quarter in Saigon. It's, it's a nice picture. It was taken in the evening. Lot of feeling, lot of emotions, right? And we see the motorbikes. Maybe these motorbikes will be run by battery in the future, electrical motorbikes instead. But there are other things maybe that you can look into this. The most obvious is the, the lighting. So we have artificial lighting that uh, makes people able to do things, right? That's how we went from the caves into the way we are living nowadays, by artificial lighting. Um, if you think a bit more, then really do like a Gedanken kind of experiment. You could say that these guys here, they have different kind of technologies incorporated. And these are some of the things that we could do with nanotechnology or with technology of today or maybe or very near future. So some newer devices, maybe this poor girl over there, she has a chronic pain. So she needs a newer device in order to stimulate that she doesn't feel the, the, the chronic pain any longer, and other kind of things on these kind of uh, devices that you can put into our bodies or onto our bodies, everything from wearable electronics and other things that generate data, consume data, and produce data, of course, and interact with us. So technology is really immersing our society now. And we also know that the society is changing quite rapidly. Right? So we know that we have an urbanization, 
people are moving from uh, into cities, so we are creating these mega cities, multi-million cities with people. We also know that the middle class of tomorrow, they will live in primarily in China, but in Southeast Asia, primarily in China. And it's the middle class that consume most of the goods. So the things that we produce are consumed by the middle class people. And this change then something, right? Uh, we have other concerns about uh, moving uh, a lot of kind of businesses. We need to keep the jobs in Europe. We need to be more competitive. We need to do things in order to save jobs so we actually can have some uh, income, so we can put food on the table and we have somewhere to live. Right? Um, so there is a need to take some actions in order to really move forward. So the society is changing very, very rapidly. Right? So thinking about what will be the kind of next technology wave or so, uh, if you think back, I mean, Gutenberg, that started with printing books, and then that was kind of knowledge in the books, and then we read the books. Now we don't read so many books any longer, but we look on our personal digital assistants or uh, on internet, so we have Wikipedia on internet where we can find information that we would like to have. If you think about the book as a display, and now we have displays in our iPhones or telephones or different kind of computers, what is the next generation of displays? And now thinking about what is happening in the game industry, you know we have this uh, augmented reality or virtual reality goggles that you take on and then you can experience different kind of things. And this is it's just a display. It's another way of projecting information into our brain. Right? So it's the book, the display, or the augmented reality, or the virtual reality, or the enhanced reality. So what is happening now is that a lot of people are working on replacing these kind of uh, rather big things still into something that you can put on your glass lenses or on a contact lens. So you don't see it, but you get the information on your retina projected, so you can get the information that you need. And you can use that for, if you do, let's say, a surgical operation, or you do some plumbing in your home, and you need to know where, where do I turn off the water, you will get this information. You don't need to read a manual. So it really enhances your abilities to do things. And of course, the, the critical thing is to what kind of information do I get, right? Because if you get the information that you kind of usually ask, then you will only get a very small part of the information available. I mean, we know now that people are kind of tracking us in our kind of uh, habits when buying clothes and uh, buying things in general. So they know what we usually buy, and then they give advertisement to us to buy more things, similar kind of things. So there is a there is an ongoing notion about we need to control what kind of information that we will get using this kind of augmented reality. So there is a need for debate about that for sure. Right? And then other things in this kind of next technology wave, we know, I mean, a car of today, it's a, it's a computer on wheel. Right? So the new model of the car is downloaded, it's just software. And then you get the car with better speed, better acceleration, or some other functionalities. So the things that we are used to, they are changing, and they changed kind of disruptively. So the cars of today, we still kind of own them, it's a possession, we, we buy them, and it's the, the most stupid buy product you can buy, because it goes down in value immediately, and you only use it in, in average two hours per day, and then it's just standing still, and it costs a lot of money. So in the future, the cars, we don't, we don't own them. We will use them when we need them. So they, and they will come, there will be autonomous driving. You don't need the driving license. So it will be a different world. And this is happening now around us. Right? So it's a lot of disruptive innovations taking place, which we are kind of living in or on the edge to live in. So it's really things happening very soon. But to, to kind of do it down very simple, it's about the data. So we're living in a world of data, and the way we consume data or use data is the way we behave in society. 
So if we go back to this kind of nature, which is really beautiful, and then think about science and especially natural sciences, it is just a description of nature. I think some of you have heard about the kind of physics of law, or law, law of physics, right? But that is not a law, it's just a description of nature used in the language of physics or physicists. Right? We have the same kind of law, chemistry, etc. So we have these kind of different languages that was used once upon a time in order to make knowledge more digestible. And now, in the nanoscale, when things are coming down very, very small, nanoscale is very, very small, right? When it comes down in that scale, all these different disciplines, the kind of language of physics, the language of biology, the language of chemistry, it's just combined. Because everything is happening at the same time. We cannot distinguish, say, oh, this is physics, this is chemistry, because it has no meaning. Something happens and we need to describe it. And this thing that we get in this kind of understanding at the nanoscale makes us to understand how nature actually works. And then we can start to mimic nature. We can do things that are similar to what nature does, but in a more predictable way. So we can kind of enhance what nature is doing and the evolution over billions of years and to make something that is really precision made to do a certain function. Yeah. So all these kind of descriptions, they are converging at the nanoscale, and then the knowledge created at that scale is immense, and this knowledge will diverge into different kind of societal sectors, into all kind of industry, into fabrics, into glass windows, into concrete uh, floors or carpeting, everything. So, it's the knowledge that generated at the nanoscale that enhance our possibility to do things for the future. So just to give you one example about um, nanotechnology that you can get some kind of perception for it. My, my gold ring is yellowish, right? And it, it, it is yellow because there are yellow light in the room and when this light falls on the gold ring, it reflects the yellow light, so you see it yellow. There is no color in the gold ring in itself, it's reflection of color. So in the dark, it's dark, right? It's not yellow when it's dark. So you need some light in order to see the reflection. When I thin it down, make it thinner and thinner, it will go from being very clear yellowish to become more bluish. At some point it will be transparent. But before that it shifts from yellow to blue and then transparent. And the reason for that is interactions happening at this scale so at some point, it's the blue light portion of the light in the room that is reflected to you. And these kind of things we can kind of structure, we can understand, and we can utilize to give certain functions. Let's say I would like to have a blue ring, then I will make it with a very thin sheet of gold on top, and then it will be blue. Right? So it's a possibility to do things and at the kind of nanoscale that enhance the function. And this kind of nanoscale gives new functionalities to the material. So you know the periodic table you learn in school, that we have all the elements in the periodic table, and they are kind of similar behavior, I mean the, the ones close to each other, and then they are more different when you go far, far apart. But when we come down to the nanoscale, we can kind of structure material either like, an, like a rod, or like a cube, or a rectangle, and depending on how we make it, materials that is in one corner of the periodic table will behave very similar to a material at the other corner. So the periodic table, instead of being a two-dimensional table, becomes like a three-dimensional space, where you have infinite kind of combinations to create a certain function. You don't need to take a specific material, you can take mm, principally any material and coin it into the function you would like to have. It's not really true, right? Of course but it's, it's a kind of uh, imagination what you can do. So it's really a plentiful of things you can do. Um, if we take the, um, the lotus flower or the lotus flower leaf, you know lotus flowers are characterized by being very clean, although they live in the most uh, difficult parts of the world with a lot of pollution, but the, the leaves are always clean. And the reason for it when we magnify the leaves is it's a, a kind of a spiky surface, a lot of spikes. So anything that falls down on that surface, 
is positioned on top of the spikes. It doesn't wet the basic surface, so it sits on like a lot of nails, if you like. Right? So it, it lies over there. And when it rains, a water drop comes, which is gigantic if you compare it with these spikes in size. So this water droplet, it rolls on top of these spikes and then it encapsulates everything on the surface into, into the interior of one water droplet. And then it rolls off. And this rolling off is much more, it's much more repellent than if the, the spikes were not there. So the spikes makes the surface be super hydrophobic or hydrophobic. And this kind of, the way nature has done, we can re replicate in, in our technology life and we can put it in, let's say, into a, a, a tube of uh, toothpaste. You know, it's very difficult to get the last piece of toothpaste out of the tube, right? Or a ketchup bottle or something. So we can, we can use these kind of phenomena in our technology world in order to save our planet. We, we throw away a lot of yogurt in the yogurt packages, for instance. 20% of the yogurt we can never consume unless we open the yogurt and take it out, which nearly no one does. Right? So there are a lot of things we can do much better. So this is just two examples of how, how beautiful it is. So now we have the kind of nanotechnology. It's like a toolbox. And the, the beautiful thing with nanotechnology now is that we, we have a possibility to, with big microscopes, right? A lot of tools that we have developed. We have the possibility to, to see things at the nanoscale, but we can also measure how energy is flowing at the nanoscale. And energy flow is a representation of what we are doing. Right? So it represents happenings on the surface or in the material. And then the third thing that we're now starting to be able to do is to follow these things over time. So we are kind of creating a space with three axes. One is precision in, in, in X, Y, Z, right? spatial location. And then another axis is time, what happens as a function of time. And the third axis is what happens as a function of energy. So with these three axes, we can characterize a material to all extents. We don't need more. So these three things characterize a material. And we're starting to get this kind of understanding in these three axes. And the reason for that is the electronic revolution, because the electronic revolution, the electronics, as we know today, has been going on for 50 years. We're downscaling, downscaling things in the solid state, in the silicon chips that we have in our computers, based on making structures at the micron scales and nowadays at the nanoscale. So the kind of electronics revolution has driven us to get understanding of nature at the nanoscale. So everything is kind of connected, right? So it's, it's not a coincidence. Things happen through a certain way. And then now we have this non, the nanotechnology toolbox. We can start to do meaningful things with this, real meaningful things. We can make, uh, for instance, sensors that we can put, uh, we can use. We take a, a drop of blood and then we can characterize and see if we have a cancer cell in our blood. We could not do that before. Now we can do it. We have the sensitivity to do it. We could take a sensor to, and build it into, let's say, an Apple Watch to measure the glucose concentration in the capillary of the skin. And if we can measure that, all the diabetic people of today, they don't need to take a blood sample every hour and analyze it. So then you will have it in your Apple Watch or and another watch, maybe not an Apple, another watch. Right? So this is the kind of possibilities that we are creating now, different kind of sensors for different kind of things. We can also use nanotechnology to structure food in a certain way. We know when we are getting older, we are losing some sensations in our mouth. So food that we used to eat when we were younger and really liked, it doesn't taste anything when you get older. But with nanotechnology, we can reshape the texture so it's it feels the same. So we can recreate the sensation, and by that, the elderly population, which will increase tremendous, as we know, they will get the sensation that they're used to, and then they will eat more, which is very healthy. They will live longer, they get all the nutrition they need, etc. So it's, it's a way of making sensors, it's a way of manipulating 
materia to get better functions or better sensations. Um, we can use it for, for other kind of things, uh, for detection of air pollution, for instance. And all these things could be coupled to wearable electronics, so we all are becoming like a, like a sensor or a probe. So if I have a wearable electronics to measure air pollution, everyone in the city of Guimarães can have that, and then the, the mayor would have a perfect control of the air in, in the city. And then you can use that information to maybe guide the traffic or to tell people don't spend time outdoors or so. I mean, it's not a big problem here, right? But in, in, in Shanghai and Beijing, it's a big problem with the air pollution. So I think nanotechnology offers a lot of things that uh, is just around the corner, which will help us to have a much better kind of living, right? So everything comes to this kind of emotional aspects. We need to create the feeling of emotions. Let's assume we make a, a robot that we have in our homes. That robot needs to express feelings and emotions, otherwise we would not use it. So this is what we are working on, on creating these kind of emotions. So nanotechnology addresses all these kind of grand challenges. The global warming, the water supply, the food supply, public health, aging, uh, pandemic, security, etc., etc. So nanotechnology has to do something with that. At INL, very, not very far from Guimarães, we have our lab, which is really a very nice lab where we work a lot on doing things to improve it for people, to improve it for society. I will not show this now, so I will stop here and say very welcome to INL. If any of you have an idea that you would like to do, you don't need to know technology. We know technology. Just come with your idea, we will help you. Right? Even better, if you have an idea and you have a consumer who would like to have that idea, it's even better. Then you are welcome to come and we will help you to do that. And uh, we have incubator, we have startup programs, we are open to the world, we are open to engage with you. Um, if you are around September 24, we have an open day, so everyone are invited to come just to walk around and see what we do. Thank you very much. Molto obrigado.